Good morning. Has everybody been seated, please? In the back, thank you. My name is George Corfiadis, and I'm the provost here at Stevens Institute of Technology. And I would like to welcome everyone today to our colloquium, Excellence Through Innovation. I'm delighted to see such a large and diverse crowd here at the historic Debound Auditorium for what is promising to be a memorable session on the impact of innovation in our classrooms and our world. At Stevens, innovation and entrepreneurship are core values. They trace back to the Stevens family who founded this institute 141 years ago in 1871. Today, they are guiding principles that we work very hard to instill upon our students, both undergraduate and graduate, through a variety of educational and research experiences and practices. We are honored to welcome two distinguished guests today that will speak and will participate in today's colloquium. Dr. Stephen Chu, the U.S. Secretary of Energy will be with us. <laughs> and Dr. John Kim, Executive Vice President of Alcat Alcatel Lucent and President of Bell Labs and Corporate Strategy is with us today also. Two outstanding Stephen Scholars, Professor Ronald Besser, the Director of our Chemical Engineering Program, and Professor Frank Fisher, an Associate Professor in our Mechanical Engineering Department, will follow, and then we'll have a roundtable discussion. A few days ago, a colleague of mine walked into my office and asked me how much sleep I'm losing these days. And uh, it took me by surprise, and before I could answer, she put a book on my desk, and she said, here, read this, and you'll lose some more sleep. It was the book, apparently she wasn't in a good mood that morning. I, she had finished the book the night before, I think. It was Tom Friedman's last book with Michael Mendelbaum, titled, That Used to Be Us. Very smart title, right? That Used to Be Us. That used to be U.S. And the tagline reads, how America fell behind in the world that invented and how we come back. I read one third of the book that night and I did lose some sleep, so the next day I ordered 15 books that I'm giving to all of our deans, associate deans, and everyone else that I think should be losing some sleep these days. The book contemplates that the U.S. future economic growth and prosperity will depend on how well we do on four challenges. How to adapt to globalization, how to adjust to the IT revolution, how to control the soaring budget deficits, and how to manage a world of both rising energy consumption and rising climate threats. I hope that today's discussion will underscore the critical importance of innovation and entrepreneurism for the future of this great country. I also hope that the colloquium will provide thought-provoking insights into these important issues and stimulate discussion, debate, and most importantly, actions well beyond today's event. And now is my sincere pleasure to introduce our moderator, Christine Lagorio, executive editor of Inc.com, who will take, it, take the reins from here on. Uh, as the Inc.com editor responsible for coverage of startups, marketing, and innovation, she is very well suited to guide today's session. Please welcome Christine Lagorio.
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Corfiatis, um, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Stevens, for hosting this colloquium. I'll be introducing each of the speakers as we progress through the morning, but first I've been asked to speak a bit about the area I report on for Inc.com and Inc. Magazine. It's also, of course, the topic of much of today's itinerary, innovation. These are tough times for the American economy. The unemployment rate is 9.1%, with some analysts saying the true jobless rate is more like 22% when you count the underemployed. We are living in a time when we are confronting some serious economic challenges and some serious structural challenges to our country. And we can't forget about some considerable competitive challenges from other countries. The way I think about it, that number of jobs our country is or isn't producing has everything to do with innovation. I report mostly on startups and entrepreneurs. There's this line of thinking in the business world that great innovators are born with their skills. It's almost a mythology built around the great American innovators, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, and most recently, Steve Jobs. Not long ago, I was interviewing Clay Christensen, the man who coined the term disruptive innovation. And he said something counter to that mythology, that innovation can be taught and learned. And that's where this country's great universities, including Stevens, come in. They have the potential to take research from the lab into the classroom and out into the world. That's not by just publishing research, but taking bright young Americans and arming them with the brashness and self-assuredness it takes to be publicly passionate enough about an idea that just seems out there, that no one else believes in. Innovation is about more than putting a patent on a process. It's about having the passion to defy odds and convince a lot of skeptical people that your idea is indeed important. And when you do, you can start a company. And the way I see it, new companies starting is one of the best opportunities our country has for creating a lot of jobs and getting that unemployment number up and turning our country around. We are at a time when innovation is more at the forefront of our discussion culturally and politically than it has since President Kennedy asked Congress to put a man on the moon. Just last week, our modern day Thomas Edison or Henry Ford, take your pick, passed away. And everyone's questioning, how do we create a country with a culture and political support and an education system that values innovation enough to create the next Steve Jobs? That's a big challenge for the people in this room to think about. There's all this debate as to where innovation comes from, and luckily, we have amazing speakers today to talk about this. We don't have all the answers here, but what we do have is the potential to discuss how to spur innovation in companies like Bell Labs, from which we have today the esteemed Dr. Jung Kim. And we have the government, which is obviously a hot topic right now regarding regulation, banks, and job growth. We have the amazing Dr. Stephen Chu here, the Secretary of Energy, and he's going to talk about some policy issues involving innovation. And we have our two professors from Stevens, Drs. Ronald Besser and Frank Fisher, who are going to bring it back to the university level. There are a lot of big issues here to talk about today. Um, I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say, and, these and I'm very proud to introduce to you these amazing speakers. We'll be starting with Dr. Pavardin. He was appointed the seventh president of Stevens Institute of Technology in January 2011. He joined Stevens from the University of Maryland, where he was a member of the faculty for 27 years. He served as the institution's acting president for two months in 2010, during his tenure as senior vice president for academic affairs and provost, positions he held since 2007. Dr. Farvarden is an accomplished researcher in the areas of information theory and coding, multimedia signal compression and transmission, high-speed networks, and wireless networks. Among his accomplishments as provost was spearheading the development and implementation of the university's ambitious strategic plan, Transforming Maryland, Higher Expectations. From 1994 to 2000, Dr. Favardin served as chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, where he was professor. He was appointed dean of the A. James Clark School of Engineering in 2000. 
Dr. Favarden has made significant contributions to a number of com communication standards and practice systems and practical systems in data communication, image and video compression, and voice coding in wireless applications. A fellow of the Institute of Electrical and, El and Electronics Engineers, Dr. Favarden holds seven US patents in data communications, image coding, and wireless communication, and has co-authored more than 150 technical papers in journals and conference proceedings. A passionate advocate for technological innovation, Dr. Favarden has served on the boards of several companies and educational nonprofit organizations. He was chosen by the governor of Maryland to serve on the state's task forces for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and nanobiology, and he chaired the University System of Maryland's task force on cybersecurity. Dr. Favarden co-founded two technology companies as well. In recognition of his contributions to the te technology education and his support of innovation and entrepreneurship, Dr. Favarden was featured in the Washington Post as one of five to watch in 2003. Among his honors are the National Science Foundation's Presidential Young Investigator Award, the George Corcoran Award for Outstanding Contributions to Electrical Engineering Education, and the University of Maryland's Invention of the Year Award in Information Sciences. Please welcome Dr. Favarden. Ms. Laguerre, thank you very much for your kind and generous remarks. I wish my mother was here to hear all of these kind words. Uh, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. You have honored me by your presence here today. I'm going to just uh, take a few short minutes uh, before our colloquium starts to talk about the key role that technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship have historically played in shaping our national destiny and how they remain central to this country's leadership position in the world as we go forward. But before I begin, let me take a moment to sincerely thank our guest speakers, all of the speakers who are here with us today. And in particular, I want to thank Dr. Chu, Secretary Chu, and Dr. John Kim for taking time from their incredibly busy schedules to join us. You have ad added luster to this colloquium, and I am personally grateful to you. For much of the modern era, our country has been a beacon of progress and prosperity for the rest of the world. This was deliberate policy, not mere happenstance, a result of sustained investments in our education system and strong support for research and innovation. Our unmatched entrepreneurial spirit, enriched by a diverse and open society, has allowed us to draw some of the most creative minds from around the globe. The results have been astonishing. Life-changing technological breakthroughs from the polio vaccine to the insulin pump to the transistor to lasers to the personal computer and to the internet. At the same time, our productive energies, supported by a society that invested wisely and generously in its people, generated millions of jobs, creating unprecedented prosperity for a huge segment of our population. This steady, decades-long rise in our standards of living engendered ever-climbing expectations. But today, at the dawn of the century, we are experiencing a shift in the global dynamic in which the United States is beginning to lose ground. Fast developing societies on every continent are investing in education systems at a rate that now often outstrips our own. These emerging economies understand that investments in education and research lead directly to social and political progress as well as global clout. They now see the value in retaining their most brilliant minds and are able to lure talent from other countries. To put it in simple words, we no longer own the, stone, the store on opportunity. And just as we now wrestle with how and where 
to make investments in our society's problem-solving capabilities, we face many new challenges, some that threaten our position in the world and others that also pose a danger to our closely linked global society. Our ever-growing hunger for fossil fuel is one such brewing crisis. There is a direct relationship between a society's standard of living and its energy consumption. This is a well-established fact. In booming economies such as China and India, rising energy use is placing unprecedented demand on a finite resource. And a byproduct of this development, largely fueled by coal and oil, is global climate change. We have only just begun to understand and grapple with the potentially catastrophic devastation that can and may ensue. Cyber attacks are yet another emerging hazard of the modern world, a new form of warfare in which not just countries, but rogue people and even individuals pose a menace. And at home, runaway healthcare costs threaten to bring our economy to its knees. Based on current forecasts on revenue and expenses by the Con Congressional Budget Office, by 2025, exactly 14 years from now, entitlements plus net interest payments will absorb all, yes, all, of USA's revenue. In other words, there will be nothing left over to spend on defense, education, infrastructure, and research and development. For these items, today, we spend 32% of our country's spending. And that itself is down from 69% 40 years ago. So our expenditures on defense, infrastructure, education, and research went down from 69% of our total revenue 40 years ago to 32% today, and it will go down to 0% in 14 years, unless we do something about it. These are all problems crying out for complete thinking and a, com and a new commitment to equally complex solutions. I do see a clear solution, a sustained, concentrated investment on the part of our society in a research and innovation-focused education system one that will empower a technology-savvy workforce to lead the world in meeting these and other challenges. And by maintaining this focus, we have the opportunity to not only solve mounting problems, but to help create new opportunities and broader prosperity. At Stevens, this is our primary mission. Throughout our history, our technologically adept engineers have focused on innovation and entrepreneurship with a view to solving pressing problems. Today, in addition to hearing from our keynote speakers, the Honorable Stephen Chu, Secretary of Energy, and Dr. John Kim, President of Alcatel Lucent Bell Laboratories, you will hear from two of our outstanding faculty, Professor Frank Fisher and Professor Ron Besser, about our legacy of innovation and its ongoing central role in our academic program and in our growing research and development efforts. At this point, I'm going to sit down and listen to our speakers. Thank you very much. As United States Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu is charged with helping implement President Obama's ambitious agenda to invest in clean energy, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, address the global climate crisis, and create millions of new jobs. Dr. Chu is, distingu is a distinguished scientist and in 1997 was awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics. He has devoted his recent scientific career to the search for new solutions to our energy challenges and stopping global climate change, a mission he continues with even greater urgency as Secretary of Energy. 
Prior to his appointment, Dr. Chu was the director of the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he led the lab in pursuit of alternative and renewable energy technologies. He also taught at the University of California as a professor in, of physics and professor of molecular, um, excuse me, uh, molecular and cell biology. Previously, he held positions at Stanford University and AT&T Bell Laboratories. Dr. Chu's research in atomic physics, quantum electronics, polymer, and biophysics include tests of fundamental theories in physics, the development of methods to laser cool and, tra laser cool and trap atoms, atom interferometry, the development of the first atomic fountain, and the manipulation and the study of polymers and biological systems at the single molecule level. Well, at Stanford, he start, helped start BioX, a multidisciplinary initiative that brings together the physical and biological sciences with engineering and medicine. The holder of 10 patents, Dr. Chu has published nearly 250 scientific and technical papers. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Chinese Amer Academy of Sciences, and number, numerous other civic and professional organizations. He received an AB degree in mathematics and a BS degree in physics from the University of Rochester and a PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as honorary degrees from 15 universities. In announcing Dr. Chu's selection, President Obama said, the future of our economy and national security is inextricably linked to one challenge, energy. Stephen has blazed new trails as a scientist, teacher, and administrator, and has recently led the Berkeley National Laboratory in pursuit of new alternative and renewable energies. He is uniquely suited to be our next Secretary of Energy as we make this pursuit a guiding purpose of the Department of Energy, as well as a national mission. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Chu. Let me see if this plug is a little bent. Okay. All it's warming up. Um, Christine, my punch line, you can't do that. Very good. All right, pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to talk about uh, how innovation has changed the world. And it's done so in remarkable ways. Um, and there are two points. That innovation lies at the heart of the wealth of a society, and that innovation, science and technology, research and development lie at the heart of innovation. So let me start by reminding you of what um, a Nobel laureate in economics wrote about. This is a person I ran across many, many years ago, became an admirer of his, and he showed, and what he got his Nobel Prize for is that increases in productivity were due to technology development. And so the issue at the time was the feeling that if capital investments were uh, matched to the labor force, uh, one could actually grow in productivity. But he said that's not really true because you put the capital investments, you make a new factory, whatever, uh, you produce more goods. But in the long run, what really matters in terms of prosperity and productivity per person is that you've got to get better at doing what you do. If you just do the same, uh, produce the same amount of cars for the same amount of workers, it doesn't really matter where the capital is going because in the end it just averages out and the productivity per person has to increase because you're getting better at it. And for that you get a Nobel Prize. Um, and in fact, he went a lot further to say that uh, it, 
you get a Nobel Prize for that because it flew in the face of uh, uh, the mainstream economists of the day. Uh, and they showed that well over half the growth in the United States uh, was due to uh, technology developments, and particularly knowledge uh, technology. And so th what he showed by looking at case histories is that indeed it, it appeared to be true. Right. So I'm going to describe a few things, innovations that really transformed the world, perhaps not as stressed as much by historians who are not uh, scientists or engineers, but I think some of these things actually changed the world far more than who was president or king or whatever. Um, I'll start by a uh, inaugural address given by William Crooks in 1898. He's the president, he was just made president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science and he starts his lecture by saying that England and all civilized countries are in deadly peril. And what did he mean by that? Europe had depleted soils, uh, even though they knew that you could take manure and other things and compost, uh, that was not enough to inert the depleted soils and the agricultural productivity in England and in Europe was declining. Uh, but what they did is they found that there were other sources of fertilizer. Uh, they used to import uh, bird guano from South America. That's a technical term for other stuff that birds do. And, um, and then they uh, latched on uh, saltpeter from Chile. And this is a nitrogen compound which seemed to really work very well. Um, and so there was a brisk business importing uh, saltpeter from Chile. But he, said, he did a little calculation and said, you know, in 10 or 20 years, 30 years maximum, based on the rise in use of this uh, incredible resource, Europe will run out. And he predicted that first hundreds of thousands and then millions of people would starve to death. So he said in his lecture, it is the chemist who must come to the rescue. Before we are in the actual grip of, of an actual dearth, the chemist will step in and postpone the day of famine to so distant a period that we and our sons and grandsons may legitimately live without undue solicitude for the future. Very poetic. So what happens? He was actually uh, spurred on by some earlier work of Wilhelm Ostwald, uh, considered the father of physical chemistry. And around that time, uh, Ostwald found that he was doing experiments, can you actually get the nitrogen from air and make ammonia? And from ammonia, you can then synthesize nitrogen compounds that uh, plants would like. Uh, and he set about, in earnest, trying to figure out how to make ammonia from air using some catalysis. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry, but he failed in this quest. Uh, the people who did succeed was a fellow by the name of Fritz Haber. And nine years after that lecture, that lecture actually set up a, a big scientific race. And nine years after that lecture, he succeeded and was awarded a Nobel Prize. He collaborated with a fellow named Carl Bosch. And the discovery of how to cat catalyze the conversion of nitrogen into ammonia was deemed so important that Carl Bosch, some years later, got a second Nobel Prize for the same work. It, it was deemed even more important than that because a couple of years ago, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for catalysis and uh, went to Gerhard Ertl. And in the announcement of the Nobel Prize, they said that at last, through Gerhard Ertl's work, we now are beginning to understand microscopically what is happening in the Haber-Bosch process. Two and a half Nobel Prizes for making fertilizer. <laughs> because it was that important. All right, so there was a more a recently a science um, uh, set of articles uh, devoted to population, um, July 2011. And, um, this is the population of the world from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, roughly 1750 till um, the present time. And uh, the Haber-Bosch process was invented where you see the arrow. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there were 700 million people. By the end of this year, there will be 7 billion people, 10 times as many. And without fertilizer, we'd be in deep trouble. However, 
What happened in the late 1960s was um, uh, impending doom, it was felt, and I quote one excerpt from a book, The Population Bomb, a bestseller by Paul Ehrlich, a uh, Stanford professor. And what he wrote was, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. So what happened? Well, two years later, Norman Borlaug was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. Why? He bred disease-resistant and dwarf strains of wheat and that could tolerate artificial fertilizers rather than the natural nourishment in the soil. With artificial fertilizers, you get growth spurts. With these growth spurts, the standard wheat uh, grew so fast it would flop over and die. So he made dwarf strains of wheat uh, with heavier kernels, and you see in the right-hand picture on the left-hand side, in his, left, in his right hand, uh, are much heavier kernels. And he made them dwarf with thicker stems so they would not keel over. So these plants could deal with artificial fertilizers, and they had much higher yield. Um, now, his work actually got criticized later by other, in other groups because with these bred strains of wheat, and then it was then used to make better strains of corn, better strains of rice, uh, that led to monocultures where instead of using whatever indigenous wheat you had, uh, you said, okay, these are but much better yields, and uh, it uh, allowed fertilizer use. And so he was criticized for monocultures. Uh, it was uh, against the biodiversity that people, some people liked, many people like, and uh, fertilizer. So he wrote later in life, some of the environmental lobbyists of the Western nations are the salt of the earth. But many of them are elitists. They do their lobbying from comfortable office suites in Washington's or Brussels. They've never experienced physical sensation of hunger. If they live just one month amid the misery of the developing world as I had for 50 years, they'd be crying out for tractors and fertilizer and irrigation canals. So this is the world grain production from 1960 to 1970, no, to 2005. The population more than doubled between that time period of time. The upper curves, the yield and production, the blue and red curves are the average yield. Uh, this is not just the United States. Uh, in India, Pakistan, Mexico, the average yield went up five times per acre. The other stunning thing is uh, you actually see the area harvested and seeded. And during that time, when the population more than doubled, food production quadrupled grain production, the amount of land put under cultivation remained the same. A true revolution, all right? And so to be sure, uh, well, first hundreds of millions of people didn't starve to death. People do starve to death, but it's more an issue of economic distribution than it is of the ability to grow food. Now. <clears throat> But are we really postponing the inevitable crisis? Haber and Bosch and artificial fertilizer allowed the population to grow from the beginning of the 20th century to the mid-20th century. And the population has grown even further. If you look at a graph like this going back a million years of the human population, you get the sense of, hmm, are we going out of control? Uh, between 1800 and 1930, and you go one to two to four, we're now at seven billion people, and it will take only 13 years to add another 13, uh, to add another billion people. So if we just postponing kicking the can down the road, and this is really what we're facing. So the good news is no. Um, if you look at the projection of population growth, it begins to slow down. And by mid-century, we are predicting 9.3 billion. And by the end of this century, it's actually projected to plateau and begin to decline. And in a number of developed countries, the population is already declining. In fact, in some countries, which don't have boosts from immigration, uh, it, they are very worried about the decline population. In one country, the fertility rate is now going down to 1.1. Now, just as a, I'm a physicist, but a lesson in biology, 
the fragility rate is, uh, in order to get a, a, a steady state population, you need something about 2 to 2.2. You actually need 2.1 to 2.2. You know, every two people produces another two people. All right? So you got two people producing one person. Uh, and so what are the reasons? Well, the reasons are multi and varied. Um, my theory is, well, here, here's at first what the correlations are. Uh, a very strong correlation between the fertility rate and the amount of women who are educated. And what is plotted on the left-hand side of the percentage of girls enrolled in secondary schools. And as the percentage goes to 100%, the total fertility rate actually goes below two. Uh, the other thing is fertility and poverty. Uh, the poorer you are, the more children you have, because in a very poor country, you don't expect all your children to uh, survive childhood. And uh, that is also part of your social security. So you have six or 10 kids, and maybe four or five of them survive, and maybe one or two of them would be willing to take care of you. Uh, and in the modern prosperous world, it's a very different story. When you have children that are born, you expect them to live a full adult life. And the other thing is, they expect you to put them through college. <laughs> also, uh, with, uh, uh, against poverty um, is uh, things like other distractions like television and late night TV, and that may have an effect on fertility. But never mind. <laughs> Okay, um, the provost spoke about transformative technologies. Uh, let me tell you of uh, transformative technology. It's, it was uh, electronics and the ability to use electronics to amplify signals. And in, I, was, I spent nine years at Bell Laboratories, and an essential component of the transcontinental telephone was the vacuum tube. For those young people in the audience, what is a vacuum tube? That's a vacuum tube. Um, and um, Bell Laboratories uh, um, bought the patent for the vacuum tube. It was ironic because uh, Lee DeForest, the inventor of the vacuum tube, actually didn't understand how it worked. He thought that this blue glow in the thing was part of the mechanism, and the blue glow was, glow was due to electrons hitting residual gas that made the vacuum turn up, tube burn out faster, but never mind that. Bell Labs soon figured out what was really going on, they became the major developers of vacuum tubes early, early on before it was even called Bell Labs. Davison uh, joined Bell Laboratories during World War I uh, to work on the war effort, and Bell Laboratories was the major developer, and they worked on vacuum tubes for a number of applications. He liked the company, he liked the atmosphere, he liked the idea that you have some freedom, and if you, even though you were there to improve the technology and get uh, a product out, you could take little diversions. Uh, so he stayed at Bell Laboratories after the war. And then in the, uh, a, a few years after the war, there was a, uh, a proposal that, uh, that it had to do with the fundamentals of a new theory of microscopic matter called quantum mechanics. And it said that you have to describe these particles like atoms or electrons or so forth that they had particle-like properties, but they also could be described and need to be described in terms of a wave equation, a so-called Schrodinger equation. Before Schrodinger wrote down the equation, de Broglie said that based on a simple other arguments, you were led to believe that they, these particles had to have wave-like properties. And, um, and so what Davison and his technician, Lester Germer, did is they took these electrons from the vacuum tube they scattered them off a piece of metal in this tube and measured how they reflected. And lo and behold, they found that these electrons reflected and obeyed the same laws as Bragg diffraction, which how the way x-rays uh, were scattered off of a crystal. And so they said, oh my gosh, this is exactly the same because it's wave properties of those x-rays that actually allow you to derive those laws of Bragg diffraction. So he gets a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, Bell Labs' first of over a dozen Nobel Prizes. Um, now, but the root of the matter was Bell Laboratories was trying to make better vacuum tubes. The essential part of a vacuum tube is you take a piece of metal, a wire, and you heat it red hot, and electrons come out. And then you collect the electrons on a plate, 
and you put a little wire mesh in between where the electrons are coming from and where you're collecting, and by adjusting very small amounts of voltage and current in this little grid, you can modulate how many electrons get across the side. That's the essential feature of how a vacuum tube, a triode, works. But they use a wire and it burns out. It gets really hot. And so Bell Laboratories started with tubes that lasted a few minutes to hours to years, and they ended up with tubes in, uh, that were going for six plus years, maybe 10 years, which is incredible because I remember when I was a kid, we had a vacuum tube television. Those tubes only lasted about a year or two. You had to take them all out, go to the hardware store, and test the tubes. Um, a young, brilliant theorist named William Shockley joins Bell Labs, and he wants to work for the great man, Davison, and vacuum tubes. Uh, but he said, no, we've got something better. In the end, long run, we're looking for a substitute for vacuum tubes. We want a solid state version of a vacuum tube. So one thing led to another. A group was formed, and over a nine year period, they developed things that led to the invention of the transistor. So they did not stumble on this invention. It was a concerted effort that really said, we're going in this direction, and uh, assembled a great number of uh, great scientists. The people who were awarded the Nobel Prize for this, Bardeen, Bertin, and Shockley, are shown here. Now, Bardeen and Shockley are theoretical physicists. Bertin is standing in the background. He's the person who actually did the work. Um, and the reason Shockley is standing there, uh, sitting there, pretending he's actually doing an experiment was because he was the department head. <laughs> For those of you who want to know, this is what the transistor looked like. It's, uh, it's something only a mother could love. Um, but it was a humble beginning that led to a lot of great things. The first integrated circuit was no prettier. In fact, it was a little uglier. Uh, but it, the transistor, and because of the solid state vacuum tube, if you will, and the integrated circuit, uh, we now have amazing things where the design rule of the highest density integrated circuits that Intel makes are 22 nanometers. That's roughly 100 atoms wide. And um, so if one has come a long way. So the integrated circuit really transformed electronics. There are a lot of things that transformed the way we communicate with each other, optical fibers, uh, and wireless communication, where you see an iPhone and an iPad. And so fantastic things that really transformed, these innovative things really transformed how information uh, flows around the world. Let me go to innovations in transportation. Uh, after the Industrial Revolution, uh, you could you were no longer dependent on human and animal power for your source of energy. Uh, or, well, th that's not your source of energy. Your source of energy is food, the uh, animals and people eat. But never mind that. So that's solar energy and biofuels. Um, but you could actually get tremendously much more power from, for example, steam engines. And here you have a steam engine. And it's uh, at a stop. And it's about to transfer some freight over to a um, uh, more local form of transportation, uh, a horse drawn carriage. Um, a little bit about the development of the railroad in the United States. Uh, it started, um, as I said, in the Industrial Revolution, but uh, during the bleakest moments of our country's history, the Civil War, you would think that the country could not spare uh, anything and had to devote all its resources to fighting a war. But the country didn't. And in 1862, Lincoln signed the Railroad Act, which said, uh, we will pick two companies. And with these two companies, we will fund the building of a transcontinental railroad, because none of the private railroad companies were willing to put a railroad across the country to connect California with the eastern states. And it was a huge subsidy. $16,000 in bonds per mile to the rail companies. And then alongside of a track, there would be a 10 mile square block of land that would be given to the rail companies. And in the next 10 miles, there would be another 10 mile block on the other side. The rail companies could either sell the land or, or develop it. And um, that led to an aggressive building of the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad. And it was completed in 1869, just seven years later. Nowadays, it would take seven years to get a permit. 
But by 19, 1870, a journey that took over six months was shortened to less than two weeks because of the Transcontinental Railroad. Dramatic change in transport over long distances. Another, another great innovation was steam-powered ships. And this is one of my favorite paintings by one of my favorite artists, Turner. And it has to do with an old warship um, that distinguished itself in the Battle of Trafalgar, is being towed by a steam tug up the Thames to be berthed and then broken up for scrap. And so you see this lovely juxtaposition of the old romantic sailing ships uh, being towed by this ugly, black, belching, iron, steam-generating tugboat uh, and a beautiful sunset. But just to remind you that uh, sail power was replaced by steam power, uh, and that transformed shipping. So the railroad and ships actually began to transport goods and people over great distances for relatively low cost. Let me talk about the airplane. Now, I'm going to start the story not with the Wright brothers. Actually, you can start way back, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, but never mind. I start with a person by the name of Samuel Langley, uh, a very distinguished scientist, a mathematician, a physicist, and astronomer. And he got a grant of $50,000 from the War Department and $20,000 from the Smithsonian in 1898. He had been starting to play around with uh, powered gliders. And they said, well, why don't you make a bigger powered glider to make it into an airplane? And so here's some money. Um, and so off he went, trying to put engines on these power, uh, rather scale up the powered gliders to get people on. Uh, this is a picture of a power glider with a person on it being launched off a little catapult in the Potomac. And uh, I don't know if you can really tell what's happening, but that trajectory is going the wrong way. It crashed. And so there was an early crash in October of 2000, uh, sorry, 1903. And um, in December 8, the second crash in 1903, Langley says, this isn't going to work. It's putting the pilot at risk. I give up. Now, after that, nine days later, the Ripers succeeded at Kitty Hawk without any government support. Some members of Congress were outraged. I can see it now. The government can't pick winners. What are you doing investing in things? Let business figure it all out, and so on and so forth. Uh, so some things don't change, except it's gotten a lot louder. With, but anyway, um, so that's what happened. But that's not the full story. As I said, the first powered flight came some nine days later. But what is forgotten is that very soon thereafter, the military began purchasing, was the primary, if not sole purchaser, but certainly the primary purchaser of all the airplanes of, of, of the Wright brothers, of Curtis and the competitor, and so on and so forth. And, um, by the beginning of the war, they had purchased dozens and dozens of airplanes, uh, tabulated that um, up until from 1909 to 1919, they had purchased some 60 different models, about half of them uh, before World War I. But it was clear by 1914, the beginning of World War I, the United States lost the lead in airplane technology. Why do I say it was clear? When the United States entered the war, and even before the war, when they began to supply the Allies with airplanes, the Allies gently told them, why don't you build our design? Because yours don't work so well. And so the US agreed. And they built uh, a British de Havilland, a DH-4. And they turned on their great industrial machine. And by the end of the war, uh, they were building uh, some 14,000 uh, airplanes one year. Uh, but the war ended, and by 1920, the production really crashed to some 300 airplanes. And so the air industry uh, was collapsing. Uh, also, people decided we can try to get the lead back from Europe. And so in 1925, Congress passed the 
Kelly Air Mail Act, and it allowed private companies to carry the precious U.S. mail. So it gave them a market. And um, it also, the Air Commerce Act, and, and this is also very important, actually uh, said something else. You know, you said there's a lot of barn burners and things going on, you know, people going on airplanes. There are a lot of crashes, and this might not be good for uh, a beginning industry if everybody's crashing. So why don't we uh, set up a thing that could actually put in some standards, minimal standards for pilot training and minimum standards for how you would make an airplane. So the big hand of regulation reached in and actually helped save the airline industry because if they don't crash, people are more, you know, even the precious U.S. mail, you don't want your precious mail to crash. So in any case, uh, this is what happened. Um, the airline industry in the United States had a very intimate relationship with um, the commercial airline industry had a very intimate relationship with the military. This is a picture of a test flight of um, a precursor to uh, a tanker plane called the KC-135, built by Boeing, and it's being put through its paces, banking very hard. And when Boeing got a big contract to make these tanker planes, they said, aha, this is what we need, because there's a cost-plus contract. Uh, we produce a similar airplane, we'll put some windows on it, and we'll call it a 707. So, um, so to say that the commercial airline industry went ahead without government support is actually uh, not correct. Now, many years later, here's a Boeing 787 that's uh, going to be delivered, I hope, in a, a half a year or so. Um, uh, and there was a columnists in the New York Times who wrote an article lamenting we're in uh, a dearth of new innovation, you know, we're here of Uganda and Omaggio, so to speak. Um, what's going on? Airplanes are pretty much the way they were 40 years ago. Uh, not quite. This one uses only 30% of the fuel as a 707. Other than that, and it flies at Mach 0 0.85 instead of Mach 0.6 or 7. So other than that, it's the same. Um, the point here is that trains and planes and ships revolutionize the transports of goods and people. You go to the market, you, will eat, you can eat fresh fruits, you can eat fish, sometimes grown across the United States and other parts of the world, including halfway around the world, uh, fresh produce and things of that nature. So it really transformed the way people move and the way we move material. Another huge transformation was the development of the automobile. Now, let me remind you that Henry Ford did not invent the automobile or the internal combustion engine. Damler and Benz did in Germany. But what Ford did do was in, improve. He didn't even invent the assembly line, but he improved upon it. And with this assembly line, uh, they were able to make high quality, low cost automobiles, and the productivity per worker went up enormously. So let me reiterate what I just said. We didn't invent this thing. We came, became the low cost producer of this object. And because the price declined so much, it actually created a mass market. Dambler and Benz make ex made excellent automobiles. They still do. Uh, but not quite reachable to the mass market. And because of that, the number of workers uh, in the automobile industry skyrocketed because you reached a different price point and then you could sell this stuff. Same thing with personal computers. When personal computers cost $10,000, $5,000, nobody bought it. Once they started to cost $2,000, $1,500, it went viral. So now, I didn't read um, Tom Friedman's book. We do talk, uh, maybe we feed off of one another and we talk numerous times, but let me tell you about something that I visited a solar plant in China, it was called SunTech. It was then the third largest photovoltaic producer in the world. Uh, its founder was a, an Australian citizen, he got his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of South Wales. He was born in China, but he was, his higher education was in Australia. He went and said, well, I want to start a business. I think we can make better solar cells. 
Australia wasn't interested. China said, why don't you come back? We'll help finance this and get you started. So when I toured the factory, this one happens to be, this is one of their factories. It's 100 meters wide by 400 meters long by four stories of production lines. And uh, these are automated production lines, very few workers. Where do they get the silicon? The United States. Why? It says, oh, the CEO says, energy in the United States is so cheap. We can't compete with that. So we'll take the silicon, we'll put it into wafers, we'll, put it, we'll dope it, we'll do all the high value, high technology, value added stuff. And oh, by the way, if Germany or Spain and the United States want to assemble these things, that's okay too. We can figure out how to do that because the real heart of the thing we can make and we can make it better and we can make it cheaper. And in fact, it's not, and I stress also better, right now this company holds the current record for polysilicon solar efficiency, 16.5% going to 18. All right? They took what Henry Ford did and did it better. Okay? And that's actually what they're doing in many, many technologies, uh, in all the energy technologies. And they, remade, they just looked at what the United States playbook was over the last uh, century and a half and said, I think we can do this too. Um, all right. Now, gasoline powered internal combustion engine really rapidly replaced horse powered vehicles. If you look at any energy related technology or deployment, it usually takes about a half a century to build up the new infrastructure. This one took uh, maybe 20, 25 years. And so you see these pictures in the late 1880s, 1890, uh, where it's dominated by horse-drawn carriages. Occasionally you see a horse-drawn cable car or an electric cable car. Um, uh, but by 1920, the scene had rapidly changed. You see in Detroit, uh, lots and lots of cars and a few cable cars, and by the uh, mid-1940s to late-1940s, you only see gasoline-powered or diesel-powered vehicles. Uh, very ra rapid. You also don't see many streetcars uh, during this time, um, in part because the automobile manufacturers bought the streetcar companies and closed them down. But another thing that hastened the transition to uh, internal combustion vehicles uh, was an environmental pollution problem uh, that would, had occurred. Well, what environmental pollution? This is, right, 1910, 1920, 1800. What's the environmental pollution problem? Well, it's horse manure. And in New York City, for example, in 1880, there were uh, 160,000 horses producing three to four million pounds of horse manure a day an equivalent amount of horse urine a day. There were piles uh, in vacant lots that were piling up 40, 50, 60 feet tall. Um, uh, the market for fertilizer manure was saturated, uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, it was piling up uh, so fast and furious that a new business enterprise started. They were called crossing sweepers. And if you were a genteel person in New York City and wanted to cross the street, there would be a little sweeper that would uh, clear a path for you. So you wouldn't have to step on as much horse manure. Uh, so it was this environmental problem that actually quickened the transition to the new form of transportation. We have another environmental problem. It may not be quite as visible or quite as an assault on our senses as horse manure, and this is greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. And so you see it's puttering along, puttering along. This is data. Uh, and then it starts to rise. And in the beginning of uh, the Industrial Revolution, it begins to climb. Um, so what has happened is that these greenhouse gases uh, trap heat uh, on the Earth and uh, prevent it, uh, as much of it from escaping. Uh, the other fact you have to know is that we have satellite data over the last 35, going on 40 years, which tracks how much sunlight energy reaches the Earth. Not only the visible light, but also the infrared light, also the sunspot activity, the ions hitting the Earth, the microwaves, everything. 
and they're amazing, there's an 11-year solar cycle, but if you average over three solar cycles, it's amazingly flat. So on the long time scale, we believe that the amount of energy hitting the Earth is constant, but the amount of energy leaving the Earth is less. All right? So imagine the amount of energy you use uh, by metabolism, exercise, whatever, is constant, but, but the amount of cheesecake you eat has gone up. Something will happen. Similarly, due to conservation of energy, although we cannot, we do not know today uh, the intricacies of on a five-year, 10-year, 15-year cycle what is happening, over a 50 and 100-year cycle, because that's, that has a lot to do with um, ocean currents and the interactions of the biosphere uh, with the increased temperatures and things like that. So very, very complicated stuff. But over a 50 or 100 year period, it gets simple again. Energy in the same, energy out less. Something will happen. And you would have to explain very hard that um, something, uh, that nothing will happen. And so um, that's what we're facing. Um, so it was this environmental awareness of every, every OECD country except two in the world recognize, whose political systems, both conservative and liberal systems, recognize, uh, and also not only OECD, but all, all, all the developing countries that I know of, uh, you know, China and India and Brazil and Mexico and so on, also recognize that uh, the, the climate issue is a real risk and we have to do something about it. The only two countries that don't are the um, United States and Russia. Russia because its entire economy is uh, built around extractive industries, namely oil and gas, and they think, well, if it warms up a little bit, that might not be so bad for Ruther, Mother Russia. And uh, the United States, well, we can talk about that some more, but not now. Um, so let me talk about the fact that we need innovation in energy that innovation in energy is essentially going to be a second industrial revolution, but this time it gives the energy we've gotten used to and where developing countries want, but in a clean, sustainable way. So here's one. The, uh, there have been steady progress in solar power. The blue curves are, this is a Moore's, it's not a Moore's law, it's, it's called an experience curve, where you have the price, but on a logarithmic scale, and you have units delivered, and what you find is you're established this learning curve. There's a little stutter here, a shortage of poly sil of silicon, but that has corrected itself. But actually, something has happened. The price of solar is going down faster than the previous learning curve over the last two years. And then uh, thin film technology, this happens to be cadmium telluride. And so uh, in the last six years, the price not only of the modules, but the full installation price of utility scale solar has dropped by 50%. Every business model says the full all-in costs will drop by at least another 50% in this decade. And um, what, do you th what we think will happen is those business models, but in the Department of Energy, we're looking at uh, these are what this costs are today. Um, it's a little under uh, $4 now. Uh, the uh, yellow is, the, the blue is the module itself, now selling for about $1.10 a watt. Uh, and just five years ago, it was selling for $4 a watt. And um, the yellow is about this balance of systems. And so we look very hard about what can we in the Department of Energy do to decrease this so that the price would drop down to a dollar watt. Why a dollar watt? A dollar watt means the levelized cost of electricity from solar would be, uh, would be the same or less than with any new form of energy, including natural gas, at $4.50 a million BTU. Okay? So, even, so we think that even a dollar fifty a watt, this will go viral. It will go viral all over the world. So the question is, do we want to import this stuff or do we want to export it? And uh, we feel very strongly that no, we want to be ex we want to be making it, inventing improvements, and exporting it. 
Another friend of mine, Michael Spence, another Nobel laureate in economics, wrote a recent paper, uh, came out a couple months ago, and he divided the economy into two sectors, what he called tradable jobs. These are goods and services that can be produced in one country and shipped around the world. Airplanes, cars, electronics, chickens. Chickens are tradable. Uh, <laughs> and, and so on. Are not tradable jobs. Uh, and these are goods and services that have to be produced domestically. Government jobs, non tradable. I am the US Secretary of Energy. It's non tradable. <laughs> um, uh, Health care, construction, much legal services because the laws in different countries, in fact, indeed, in different states are different. So that's, they divided those sectors, and then they discovered from 1990 to 2008, employment grew by 27 million jobs. Sounds great. Virtually all of it was on the non-tradable sector. Any job where you actually, in the aggregate, not any job, but in the aggregate, uh, the tradable side of the economy, where we have to compete with the rest of the world, did not grow at all. Here are non-tradable jobs, government, healthcare, retail, uh, hotels, accommodations, food service, construction, dry cleaning, those are non-tradable jobs. You don't send your dry cleaning to Europe. Well, some may, but we, I can't. In fact, I don't even believe in dry cleaning, but never mind. Uh, these are the tradable, uh, manufacturing in three sectors. I take a little difference. They, they, they classified finance and insurance as tradable. It's partially tradable, partially not. So that's the only tradable one that went up. And if you divvy that up, you'll find that the um, tradable insurance um, and finance uh, did go down. And agriculture and electronics and automobiles and so on. All right? Now, What's the value added per job? Well, the tradable ones went up a lot higher because if you have a job, you have a supply chain, you also have service jobs, the non-tradable ones that actually go to service the people who have the tradable jobs. And so this doesn't even include that. This just includes the value added and um, the non-tradable ones went up a little bit, but most of it is in the tradable part. So this economist echoed what Robert Solo echoed, what uh, others, a few others have echoed, and they say not all jobs are created equal. Okay. And uh, that's a very important lesson. So let's talk about a few other technologies. Um, Oregon National Lab uh, made some discoveries uh, in batteries. Uh, we invented the lithium ion battery, uh, both the lithium ion with the cathode being uh, cobalt phosphate and then lithium ion iron phosphate. Uh, the person actually was supported by the Department of Energy, but it was Sony that made it commercialized first. And then uh, Japan uh, for, dominated the lithium ion battery market. Uh, Korea came along and they're fighting it out. And the United States in advanced batteries, rechargeable batteries, uh, has about one or two percent of the market, even though we invented it. Uh, we think we can get this one back, just as we got airplanes back. Um, Ford automobiles are actually coming back quite strong. After a near-death experience and after the death experience of GM and Chrysler, we think that they may be able to come back. But, but this grew out of research at Argonne National Laboratory out of a synchrotron facility. This is a light source based on particle accelerators that were developed for high energy physics research. It then became to be used for mostly material science research and structural biology research and pharmaceuticals. But out of this grew a better understanding of the uh, mesoscopic uh, physics and chemistry in lithium ion batteries. A little manganese could go a long way. The batteries became safer, cheaper, easier to manufacture. Uh, and uh, uh, the rest is history because this first discovery made 10 years ago is now in a Chevy Volt battery. We actually are making a number of other, we're investing in a number of other battery technologies, very, very exciting. As they go around the world, I have to tell you that the best ideas are still coming out of uh, research universities, out of national laboratories, out of inventors in garages. So that part has not changed. 
We're also using supercomputers to understand very complex airflows. Uh, you all know that these, these streamlining that go above the cabs of trucks uh, took only a year or two became, before they became ubiquitous among truckers. Um, uh, then with additional studies of how airflows go around trucks, one could understand how to streamline the bottom of the truck with a little plastic widget as shown down here. And we think that this will add an additional 7 to 12 percent fuel savings in long distance trucking, just this little piece of plastic. Came out of high performance supercomputing. Other supercomputers have been used to design high performance, low emissions diesel engines with Cummings. Uh, so they skip the entire build, design, check it out, and redesign and rebuild and check it out step. It was designed on a high performance computer. They built one prototype, it worked as expected, they went into production. So again, there is real space for technology and we still lead in this. We have to capture carbon from coal plants, from gas plants, from cement plants, uh, from you name it, otherwise we'll be in big trouble. And so uh, how do you decrease the cost of the capture of this and so you run the flu gases or whatever uh, through something that catches the carbon dioxide. It, it turns out that the rate of absorption of the carbon dioxide on a material, uh, you get a faster rate, but it, it seems to be proportional to how deeply bound uh, the carbon dioxide is on this material, like an amine. And so wouldn't it be better if you could actually have the carbon dioxide attach very quickly into a fluid or on a surface, and then with very little energy, release it. Actually, you do this, you figured, maybe you haven't figured it out, but you do this uh, every time you exhale. In metabolism, you generate carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide has to be transported out of the body. There's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that increases the rate of absorption of the carbon dioxide into your bloodstream, goes to your lungs, you just exhale it. You're not heating up anything. It's all done at body temperature. Uh, why can you do this? It has to do with the free energy of what's allowed, but it's, the magic is in the enzyme. And so the question is, can you get this enzyme to work in a flue gas environment? Can you get it to work not at body temperature, but at 75 or 80 degrees C? Can you get it to work in a high concentration of amine, five molar or three molar concentration, because a normal enzyme would just curl up and die, and most proteins begin to actually uh, unravel at 75, 80 degrees centigrade. So we're sponsoring a number of research to do that. One's a very synthetic way of getting this type of enzyme to survive in a flue gas environment. Um, let me tell you another way that we're also sponsoring. This is really cool. It's called directed evolution. What you do is you have an enzyme that you find in nature, and you just shuffle up the, the enzymes and make a new generation of these things. Some of them, many of them don't survive. And then you put it through a test. You put a little bit of amine in it, you raise the temperature a little bit, and you see which ones survive. And then you take the survivors, and you shuffle their genetic material, and you mutate some more, and you throw it back in, but you up the temperature and you up the amine solution a little bit more, and you see what happens. So the great thing about microbes is um, there are no people to protest this. Um, <laughs> animal rights people. Um, and the other thing about it is you can, have, you can make generations of these things. Now, that's what's called directed evolution, and the inventors of this are now getting prizes. It's a big deal. Uh, but there's directed evolution 2.0. And let me describe that. In normal directed evolution, you just pick the best of the survivors, and you, and you change the environmental conditions, and you hope that it evolves. In directed evolution 2.0, what you do is there's an algorithm that begins to identify which genes, which proteins actually seem to work towards survival, but sometimes you can discover a gene where the overall set is not good, but this one seems to be helping in some way. So without going into the details of that, you can then take, and this is, you, you shuffle the genes, the, the green guys, let's say, are good ones, the red guys are not so good ones, but you take all the ones that have some good in them, even though the overall effect may not be net good or the best. 
and then you do another shuffle, and then you do another shuffle. So it's going a little bit deeper into what's responsible for the behavior you want. And so after four generations, they took an enzyme that couldn't survive more than 30 or 40 degrees centigrade, and the combination of temperature and high amine solution, that, that was the figure of merit, they got a 100,000-fold improvement. And uh, right now, uh, if you can get this enzyme just the last three months instead of a day, uh, you have something commercially viable that's ready to go. It would be much, much better. So it's a combination of this enzyme and amine. Again, this is some of the really cool stuff that's being invented in the United States and that we support. So I think the, the, the moral of what I'm trying to say is that America does have an opportunity to lead in these clean energy technologies. Um, uh, we remain the most innovative country in the world, but invented in America is not good enough. You don't want a box where an iPhone and iPad to say invented in America, assembled in China. Uh, you really want it to say invented in America, made in America, and sold worldwide. Because remember the economy, the tradable part of the economy, if we just have untradable parts of the economy, and our whole economy becomes that, we will still be importing things. So again, as a physicist, there's a net conservation law. Okay? <laughs> you're not creating wealth to the outside world, but you have, you have to buy things from the outside world. This is not good. And so, um, you know, so I was listening to the provost's introduction. That used to be us. Uh, the message is, we can become us again. We did in many other sectors. We better become us again in the energy sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary. Next, we have Dr. Jung Kim. He's Executive Vice President of Alcatel-Lucent and President of Bell Labs and Corporate Strategy. He is a member of the Alcatel-Lucent Management Committee. Dr. Jung Kim originally joined Lucent Technologies in May 1998, when Lucent acquired Yuri Systems, Inc., a high-tech communications equipment company, which he founded in 1992 and served as its chairman and CEO. During his tenure at Lucent, Dr. Kim initially served as the president of Lucent's former broadband carrier networks. In 1999, he was named chief operating officer and later president of Lucent's optical network group. He left Lucent in 2001 to join the University of Maryland faculty with joint appointments in both the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Department of Mechanical Engineering. He rejoined the company in April 2005 as president of Bell Labs. Dr. Zhang Kim's early career encompassed computer design, satellite systems design, and data communications, and included seven years as a nuclear submarine officer in the US Navy. He holds a PhD in reliability engineering from the University of Maryland, a master's degree in technical management, and bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and computer science from Johns Hopkins University. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Please welcome Dr. Zhang Kim. Good morning. It, uh, it is a really an honor to appear before this exceptional audience and to contribute to this curriculum on excellence through innovations. Above all, I'm really excited to be here to pay my respect to Nehemiah Fabadin and express my delight in his appointment as the president of this Fanare Institute. Nehemiah sets the bar really high on everything he does and inspires those around him to do likewise. I know that, I know that bringing someone like Stephen Chu to this colloquium is in part demonstration of the aspiration and powerful affirmative signal to entire Stevens community. 
I have no doubt that under his leadership, Stevens will become uh, increasingly be seen as an institute where good students come to be great. And this brings me to the very topic that I would like to explore with you today, achievement of great things through great innovations. Great innovations, what exactly does that mean? And where are they to be found? At the close of the 20th century, John Brockman asked the web community to nominate the greatest single invention of the past 2,000 years. And suggestions include cloud, printing press, clock, television, and contraceptive pill. All good candidates, but are they simply great inventions or truly great innovations? Is there a difference? I would say that the human inventions leads to expansion of knowledge. That knowledge might be of a universal nature, an element of larger truth that very likely the product of a scientist or philosopher. On the other hand, the knowledge might be of a more functional nature with immediate applicability to a task. It is likely to have resulted from a efforts of craftsmen or entrepreneurs. And between them is the land of techno science inhabited by ever resourceful engineers. Innovators, however, do not seek to expand the knowledge uh, for its own sake. Theirs is a pursuit of discovery that will register impact on markets and on society. And that impact will result from satisfying the unmet needs of those markets. The greater the need, the greater the potential for innovations. So I offer my rather first um, obvious observations. Great innovations satisfy great need. Often, core needs can be masked by other behaviors or remain within the subconscious realm of consumers. As a result, the ability to recognize or reveal latent market demand is crucial. As is sometimes said, one does not decide to build a bridge by counting the number of consumers crossing the river. To consider the latest great innovative product from Apple, iPad. Was there throughout the order of time, or at least since the beginning of the information age, some pre-model human needs for an iPad? If so, why wasn't the tablet PCs marketed by Microsoft and others back in 2001 more successful? You may remember this device. <laughs> there were essentially the portable PCs where the screen would rotate and transform into a pad, and they all offered the capacity for data entry with the stylus. Not only did they share the similar form factor with iPad, but they were envisioned to share many of the same cap capabilities. Then again, there were quite a few capabilities that they didn't share. Why not? Well, consider the frame of reference for the designers of the tablet PCs. It wasn't a television or media player. It wasn't an e-book. It was the laptop. Specifications were um, in large part, extra extrapolated from the experience of laptop users. Architectures were borrowed and platforms reused. The engineers of the tablet PCs were trapped by their own experience. This curse of knowledge blinded them to other potential frameworks and market needs. At Bell Labs, we long ago adopted a cross-disciplined approach for research to ward off this curse. We believe that the cross fertilization of ideas and perspectives, along with cultural and other forms of diversity, lead to a less restrictive view of solutions for broader set of needs. Of course, Nehrman knows this principle as well and calls his approach hypernated engineering. To quote from Norm Augustine's book, Is America Falling Off the Flat Earth? At the University of Maryland, his leadership and approach were embodied in a new engineering building where nanotechnology, bioengineering, and information technology would share common space for labs, instruction, and discourse. Another explanation for the fate of the tablet PCs is that there was no explicit demand, that this demand only materialized as a result of another innovation. By the way of example, consider elevators. Elevators had existed for thousands of years, but until Elisha Oris introduced the elevator brake in 1854, they were only used for cargo. This device could bring a free-falling elevator to a complete stop in inches should each cable break. Oris's safety innovation gained widespread attention at the World's Fair that year and unleashed a huge demand for the people carrying elevators. And as a result, our urban landscapes were totally transformed. In an analogous way, Perhaps it was the applications or apps for short, or the notion of an app store that unleashed 
the demand for the iPad, or perhaps it was the success of its little cousin, the iPhone. As you can see, the ability to grasp and define the fundamental market need is far from simple. Adopting a broader market radar or accounting for the dependencies is likely to help. But success can be jeopardized by yet another factor, or too prevalent within the technical community. It turns out that as engineers, many of us have something that I call innovation dyslexia. Victims of this condition design a, a solution which they become quite enamored and then infer market needs their solution could satisfy. Innovation dyslexics also tend to distort the magnitude of those needs. Unfortunately, they are likely to generate little in the way of great innovations. Let me give you an example. In the US telecom industry in the late 1980s and 1990s, investments poured into a technology called ISDN. Back then, consumers could access data by means of 28 kilobits per second modems. The basic ISDN service would bump that rate up to 64 or 128 kilobits per second. More importantly for telcos, it promised more efficient operations. Marketing organizations pitched a bounty of new genera revenue generating ISDN services related to remote education, improved healthcare, civic engagement, and the like. But doubling or even quadrupling bandwidth failed to have any substantial impact on the market needed uh, needs related to these or most other areas. The added cost for the ISDN service, along with the requirements to purchase new device, didn't help either. ISDN may have been inflamed the hopes and desires of the telcos, but not the market. It was perceived as an incremental solution. Truly great innovations are more likely to emerge from aspirations for solutions that are orders of magnitude or beyond the incremental. Such innovations are disruptive. They are not only meet the fundamental market needs, they usher in whole new dimensions for improving human experience. Now, let me offer another observation. Creating great innovations require the right set of assets. And remarkably, some of these assets are nowhere to be found in the corporate balance sheets. Look closely. You will find land and buildings, goods and receivables, but you will be hard pressed to find the people on the balance sheet. And I'm not talk about, talking about the cost for employees accounted for on the income statement. Rather, I mean the asset value of the people, the best people. A few decades ago, the globally renowned electronic company Philips turned its attention towards Bell Labs. They wanted to understand why Bell Labs was more successful than Philips Lab in generating great innovations. Philips observed that both labs sought out the best and brightest graduates. But whereas Philips recruited from local universities, Bell Labs recruited globally. In fact, traditionally more than 50% of Bell Labs researchers were born outside the United States. Bell Labs understood the value of hiring the very best people and cast its net worldwide. In the same notion is echoed by Jim Collins, the author of the book Good to Great, in his succinct admonition, first who, then what. Many, in, many of the innovations I have observed firsthand were based on applied research done by those outstanding researchers. And the agenda for the such research was shaped by the ongoing interaction of researchers with the market in meetings with, with customers, policymakers, and our own business division colleagues. These conversations help us to validate assumptions on what will likely be emerging needs. The intensity of ongoing market interaction is a key distinction between, for industry-based research versus university-based research. For in the latter, the imperative is generally to expand knowledge in a particular technical discipline. In industrial research, knowledge expansion is more mission driven. While finding answers and discovering new knowledge is important, the real challenge in industrial research is knowing what questions to ask, what, which problem needs to be solved in the first place. So let me offer an example of how industrial research serves as a catalyst for information. In the 1990s, the huge transformations were underway in communications networks, the changes that would enable a massive increase in bandwidth. Two innovations in particular play a key role. The first enabled the faster transmission rates over optical fiber, 
which was at the time trying to evolve from 2.5 gigabits per second to 10 gigabits per second. At this increased transmission rate, dispersion would become a major problem. By dispersion, I mean the tendency of the, a, a different parts of the light signal to travel at different speeds. Finding a solution to this problem, manufacturers of the optical fiber cables had released new product to compensate for dispersion. The fibers in these cables were designed um, and engineered to have a zero dispersion at 1.5 microns, the wavelengths where most of the optical traffic was centered. Thus, promise of 10 gig transmission could be realized. The second innovation allowed a multiple wavelengths of light to occupy a single fiber, a technology known as wave division multiplexing, or WDM. The prevailing assumption was that with WDM, eight or 16 wavelengths could traverse these zero dispersion shifted fibers. But things didn't work out. Expected throughput just wasn't materializing. At about the same time, two Bell Labs researchers, Andy Krabbe-Levy and Bob Koch, were exploring what was then a relatively obscure subject of non-linearities. But recognizing the market interest in deploying the AWDM solutions, they began to redirect their uh, research to focus on new questions. And then Bob soon discovered the reason behind the disappointing research of the initial WDM systems. And sure enough, it had to do with optical nonlinearities resulting in crosstalk among multiple light signals traveling in the same fiber. Their solution was not to use the zero dispersion shifted fiber, but to introduce just the right amount of dispersion at 1.5 microns to compensate for the nonlinearity effect thus removing the crosstalk. The outcome of the research was a new fiber called TrueWave, which in turn enabled the promise of WDM to be fulfilled. Another asset that you will not find on any balance sheet is culture, the right culture. A good example of how culture affects innovation can be found in Dima Adamski's commentary on the origin of RMA in his 2010 book, The Culture of Military Innovations. RMA, or revolution in military affairs, refers to the way in which armed forces are transforming through the use of new technologies and organizational concepts. For example, RMA requires full integration of precision-guided missiles, surveillance drones, and real-time command, control, and communications technologies. The concept originated in the Soviet Union during the 1970s, but the Soviet rigid military bureaucracy was unable to adapt to the degree required by RMA doctrine. RMA then found its way to the United States. Given US military's affinity for technology-based solutions, you might think that it would be the first to operationalize RMA. But the bottom-up entrepreneurial culture of the US military, in fact, made it resistant to the highly centralized coordination required by RMA. The first country to actually use RMA was Israel in its 1982 clash with the Syrian Air Force in the Lebanon's Baqa Valley. Israeli's military culture was born out of continuous resource constraints and constant threats. It was defined first and foremost by creative adaptability. By implementing RMA, the Israelis overwhelmed and overwhelmingly dominated their battle. While we can debate where and when this innovation materialized, it's quite clear that culture of this organization played a key role in its ability to have an impact. Don't know what happened here. Technology huh? problems. Ah. Well, let me go on. Closely related to culture is leadership. Great leaders can lead great people to achieve great innovations. As the Silicon Valley folklore goes, Steve Jobs paid a visit to Xerox Park's research facility in 1979. There he saw park engineer Larry Tesla move a cursor across the screen with a aid of what was called a mouse. As the cursor moved over icon on the screen, the Tesla clicked one of the buttons on the mouse and the world changed, at least from the perspective of Steve Jobs. Upon returning from his visit, he met with an industrial designer and described what he wanted. While the Xerox mouse would cost $300 to build, Jobs required that his mouse to be manufactured for 
15. The Xerox mouse would break within a few weeks due to clogging effects of a dirt and dust. Jobs required that his mouse last for years. Jobs had a vision. It came to life even as he was catching Tesla move and click. He transformed that vision into specific challenges for his talented people. In other words, he provided leadership. The pursuit of great innovation often means setting the bar really high. And at this height, the likelihood of failure is always present. It follows that to succeed in achieving great innovations, one must also succeed in dealing with failures. And to succeed in dealing with a failure, we must confront the ultimate failure, that is, failing to learn from our mistakes. There is indeed a wisdom in Thomas Edison's off-coded response to questions asked about his failed light bulb experiments. Edison had not failed, he said. He had found 10,000 ways they wouldn't work. To create disruptive innovation, we need to take risks. Like Edison, we will fail. And like Edison, we need to learn. But some organizations unknowingly erect barriers to learning from failures. Corporate recognition program in particular often breed such obstacles. Consider the common practice of rewarding employee based on their achievement of mutually agreed objectives or key performance index KPIs. Such programs can cultivate a risk adverse approach. When the prevailing attitude is failure is not an option, a pervasive dynamic overtakes the process of defining mutually agreed objectives. They will be constrained by what was achieved in the past, not informed by the opportunity of what might be achieved in the future. They will lead to predictable outcomes. But for the market, realities defined by change, such outcomes will be inadequate. Alternatively, consider recognition programs for, that focus more on behaviors. These programs can be more accommodating of change and risk taking. They are more likely to allow an employee to learn and benefit from failures. Recognition program often suffer from yet other limitations. They are subservience to the calendar. The imposition of a calendar, say an annual performance review, can diminish the would-be innovator's appetite for risk taking. When the month of the truth arrives, successes had a better be registered for research to off researchers to offer promise, let alone the hollow sound of failure will do little to assure professional growth or appease the board of directors. But the pace of research is not synchronized to quality research, and the market's windows of opportunity are not beholden to the fiscal calendar. Fortunately, there are ways to accommodate these two dictates of time. For example, we could uh, evaluate researchers on both one-year and three-year timeframes. The one-year term determines the bonus, while the three-year period decides rank and salary. The process bespeaks a commitment to investing in the early, risky stages of innovation. It makes clear that while failures may result, it is expected employees will learn from them and grow. But ultimately, there is a deadline for success. One of the most difficult challenges in learning from failure is to know when a failure actually occurred. People naturally seek positive outcomes and set about to trying to prove that experiment works and has value. It is here that cognitive dissonance is alive and well. Often, even when the evidence suggests otherwise, team pushes on. And it is only the success of rivals pursuing other method that brings home the harsh truth. To, success, to succeed in dealing with failure is to acknowledge when the failure has occurred and close the door promptly on the initiative. It sounds reasonable. Of course, but shouldn't we also reward tenacity and enthusiasm in our talented people? To close the door or not, this is an all too common dilemma and one that demands great judgment. On one hand, insidious cost of not curtailing a failed approach saps creative energy. On the other hand, the failure to support the very risk-taking behavior that you have professed, professed to encourage might carry a cost in lost faith and frustration. A dialogue that frames the issue in terms of opportunity cost can be helpful. There is a significant opportunity cost of not having the use of talented individuals on the project with greater promise. Let me offer an example. Several years ago, researchers at Bell Labs came up with an algorithm for addressing network security. The potential was exciting enough that we created a venture to which we could productize those algorithms. For various reasons, 
Patriot did not fare well, but the team wanted to continue, even so, I pulled the plug. And when I did, those researchers recognized that the algorithms could be used in other ways to provide, to provide insight into resource impacts of applications running on the wireless networks. The beauty of their design was that they could do this without employing intrusive methods like a DPI or deep packet inspection. These researchers now devoted themselves to what became another venture, a product we call Wireless Network Guardian, or WNG. WNG drew strong interest from wireless carriers who were struggling to manage the impact of more demanding smartphone applications and tablets. YNG is now core uh, to our mobile network management platform. So, um, I have proposed uh, three attributes to support great innovations. First, understanding the market needs. Second, assembling the talented people with appropriate market access, culture, and leadership. And third, building the capacity to manage and learn from failure. I would like to add one more, the flexibility to change. Change means different things to different people. The cosmologists measure change by a clock whose hands sweeps over millions or billions of years. Archaeologists tend to think in millennia. But the clock that I'm thinking of measures in the time where which our expectations are formed and our actions are bounded. That period of time at its longest can be marked by our lifetime. During that time, we experience and adapt to a huge number of changes in factors such as biology, environment, or society. Among the most influential of such factors are knowledge and information. At the beginning of the 20th century, the amount of new information one might need to accommodate would double over average lifespan. The flexibility to accommodate this rate of change was apparently not beyond most of us. Today, according to the several studies, information is doubling every three or four years. At this rate, over one's lifetime, information would not just double, it would increase by hundreds of thousands or millions of times. Over the past two decades, we have responded to this information onslaught by accentuating our degree of specialization. We see this in academics and in many of the today's professions. However, I believe this one-dimensional response, the pursuit of greater depth in increasingly narrow discipline, will fail to provide the quality of innovation to which we aspire. In addition to going deeper, we must sometimes go wider. For the leading edge of discovery and innovations often occurs at the intersection of diverse disciplines. When it comes to embracing change, my favorite quote is from Eric Hoffer. Quote, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with the world that no longer exists, unquote. At the organization level, we have already touched on the importance of learning from failure. We should also be wary of another paradigm of success leading to a failure. Let me explain. Most successful companies, having achieved a technical innovations, will seek to innovate in their business practices as well. However, an organization gets third, <coughs> gets third has said in that steers the company in its current course and speed. Borrowing a, borrowing a term from psychology, organization uh, gets third represents a combined impact of how a company is organized, how company's processes works, and how each management style shapes the behavior on what has been rewarded in the past. Resisting initiative aimed at reform, such initiative will likely to keep the company aligned with the past. A former provost at MIT, Bob Brown, once replied when asked about his efforts to change the MIT curriculum, quote, you just don't realize how difficult it is to overcome 100 years of excess, success and excellence, unquote. When significant changes do occur, and market becomes less predictable, where intentioned and proven practices will soon be at cross purposes with the market necessity. Today, where the one sure constant is not just only change, but increasing rates of change, organizations must build in the framework work for their own reinvention. Costing is not an option. Academic institutions, too, must adapt to this reality. What, after all, is to become a university, an entity that studied life as a guild for students seeking to learn the law, medicine, religion, and philosophy in the Middle Ages? Knowing Nehriman as I do, I'm confident that Stevens will remain at the forefront of efforts to answer that question and explore 
new options for keeping our academic institutions, institutions highly relevant. As I noted earlier, he's a great believer in interdisciplinary research. He recognizes the value of collaborations between university and industrial labs. It is a view that I share based on many collaborative risk initiatives in which Bell Labs participate. And it is a view increasingly shared by public agencies seeking to promote innovations. Achieving greatness through great innovations is worthy objective for all of us. It can be achieved by seeking out solutions to satisfy a need, not the inverse. It will require having right assets on board. And it will also require summoning the courage and wisdom to learn from failures on ammunition that might seem trite, but is so often disregarded when the commitments of the first fiscal quarter or fiscal year room over us. And finally, it will result from challenging your own orthodoxies for how you innovate in the face of radical change. In such a world, the value that informs so many of your traditions must be reassessed. Some may prove worth, worthy of holding onto and strengthening, but others may no longer be as relevant as they once were. Who better to conclude these thoughts on achieving greatness through great innovations than Leonardo da Vinci, the very pers personification of Renaissance, master painter, architect, engineer, mathematician, musician, and artist. But above all else, he was the master innovator, so let us pay heed to his message. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. At this time, we are going to take a brief 10-minute break, and we will return with another presentation, followed by the roundtable discussion. Dr. Ronald S. Besser is professor and chair of the chemical engineering program here at Stevens. His research focuses on understanding the fundamental behavior and advantages of applying micro and nanotechnology to enhance alternative energy approaches. Areas impacted by this approach include hydrogen production by processing of fuels in microplasmas, direct nanostructuring of fuel cell electrodes to improve efficiency and reduce precious metal loading, and enhancing photovoltaic panel efficiency through integration of nanomaterials. Dr. Besser is also engaged in teaching at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. He is founding faculty member of the Green Engineering Minor and Graduate Certificate Program and has taught sustainable energy at the, uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that, Superior in Ecuador for um, two summers in support of these curricula. In addition, Dr. Besser is involved in a National Science Foundation funded math science partnership that seeks to improve New Jersey science and education through direct interaction with middle school teachers in graduate courses on energy science. Prior to academia, Dr. Besser spent several years working in Silicon Valley. Dr. Besser holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley and master's and doctorate degrees in materials science and engineering from Stanford University. He has numerous technical publications and patents. Dr. Frank Fisher is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and co-director of the Nanotechnology Graduate Program at, here at Stevens. Dr. Fisher earned bachelor's degrees in mechanical engineering and applied mathematics from the University of Pittsburgh in 1995, master's degrees in mechanical engineering and learning sciences from Northwest, Northwestern University in 1998 and 2000, respectively, and a doctor, doctorate in mechanical engineering from Northwestern University in December 2002. Dr. Fisher is the director of the Nanomechanics and Nanomaterials Laboratory, studying the behavior of advanced material systems at the nanoscale. Particular matter, material systems of interest include polymers and polymer nanocomposites, as well as thin film um, and uh, plesioelectric materials of interest in applications. Current research efforts of the group include, include micro nanomechanics, process structure properties of polymer nanocomposites, um, and ener for energy harvesting applications. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Air Force Operations Scientific Research, the U.S. Army, and the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. He has been awarded the National Science Foundation's Career Award 
the American Society of Engineering, Education, Mechanics Division, Ferdinand P. Beer and Russell Johnson Jr. Outstanding New Educator Award and lots and lots of other awards. He was recently added to the Fulbright Specialist roster. Please welcome Drs. Besser and Fisher. Thank you for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here with this um, esteemed group of speakers. It is customary at the time of significant transition at an institution to reflect back on the beginnings of that institution, on the accomplishment of the founders, and on the progress that has been made following their pioneering work. On this occasion of the inauguration of a new president of the institute, we wish to take just a few minutes to do that, especially in connection with innovation in energy science and technology. So we will very briefly discuss the early days of the Stevens family of innovators and of the institute they founded. We'll then transition to discussing how this legacy is playing out on a daily basis today in education and research. We re recently celebrated at Stevens the 140th anniversary, um, being found, Stevens being founded in 1870. When we think back on those times, a number of innovations which significantly contribute to our lives today were either just newly discovered or not yet discovered. So for example, the incandescent light bulb was not yet commercialized. That was to come in 1878 by the wizard of Menlo Park, Thomas Edison. The first commercial electrical power plant in the US would not appear for 12 more years. The telephone had not been invented. The first commercial oil well in the US was drilled only 11 years earlier. The first transatlantic cable, telegraph cable, had been laid only four years earlier. And not surprisingly, there were no standardized time zones in the US. So kind of in summary, in 1870 United States, the medium to long distance communication could be considered rudimentary. The energy supply was at a point of transition. Deeper energy sources would, would be needed to move to the next phase of industrialization. In fact, it's very interesting, 1870 is at a crossroads. If you look at a graph of principal fuel sources in the US, you see wood declining and coal about to take off. And then petroleum a few decades later as the automobiles mass produced then taking over as well. So 1870, right in the middle of that transitional period of energy. Third, by inference, science-based engineering to advance technology would be critical for progress to the next level. And fourth, as a consequence, a steady supply of technology innovators would be needed to take the science-based engineering approach into society to enable progress. So realizing this need, the Stevens family, through a generous endowment, of property and finances of Edwin A. Stevens, for whom this building is named, the youngest Stevens of Colonel, the youngest son of Colonel John Stevens, founded the Stevens Institute of Technology here in Hoboken, New Jersey, in 1870. And the first catalog had this reading right at the very front. It was determined, as has been stated, to create a school of mechanical engineering. And as this was to be of a high educational order and to involve a general and not a merely industrial training, it was thought best in memory also of its magnificent founder to call the new school the Stevens Institute of Technology. And there you see Edwin A. Stevens, the magnificent founder of Stevens. Okay, so the roots of innovation 
at Stevens run deeply in the Stevens family. Going back to Edwin's father, the patriarch, Colonel John Stevens, who was born in 1749 and trained as a lawyer, but he achieved success and acclaim in many fields, including in business, public service as the treasurer of New Jersey in the colonial era, um, but achieved, he, uh, and also he, he made significant achievements in technology, especially in power generation and transportation. So I'd like to, rather than go through a litany of his accomplishments, just focus on one from the area of steam power generation. So in the late 1700s, Colonel John was focusing on a new steamboat concept to use as a ferry for the harbors and rivers surrounding New York City. And in realizing this concept, he produced a design for the steam engine boiler, which you see in the figure there, which immediately addressed the significant problems of steam power, namely safety, efficiency, and performance. So his concept involved dividing up the boiler from being a single container into a number of sections in the form of dozens of two-inch uh, diameter copper tubes that you can see um, running along the length of the boiler there. Um, and so water would enter the tubes and the fire was outside the tubes. So immediately safety was improved due to greater strength of the smaller diameter and the lower volume of water that was contained. The improved strength permitted higher pressure operation, which improved efficiency and performance. And a key here would be obvious to most any of our undergrads in engineering that all of that additional surface area promoted heat transfer in the system. So this elegant and yet straightforward approach was patented with the help of one of Colonel's Colonel John's other sons, John Cox Stevens, who you see there, in 1803 in the US and in 1805 in England. And here you see the 1805 patent document. And the development early on, so this we're talking the turn of the uh, century there, was called by H.W. Dickinson in his 2011 book, A Surprising Anticipation of Subsequent Development. So this anticipation, this legacy, can be appreciated by considering the significant work that appeared afterward. Ultimately, patents for multi-tube boilers that built on this concept appeared in France in 1828 and England in 1829. And then more than 60 years later, the Americans Babcock and Wilcox obtained a patent for a boiler variant that launched them into a successful steam generation, generation business made possible by the multi-tube boiler. Modern steam turbines, which closely reflect the legacy of Colonel John, have water tube boilers. More than half the energy produced in the world today comes from water tube boilers. Stevens' innovation was evident early on in the new institute as well. In the late 19th century, the technical education movement called for a greater incorporation of the scientific basis of technology and a hands-on approach. Stevens chose to emphasize hands-on exper experiences in fundamental phenomena, labs involving operation and testing of practical systems, capstone projects by student teams, and exposure to innovation and entrepreneurship through projects with outside industry involvement. These are all things we do today. These are things that we value today at Stevens, and they form a vital part of our curriculum. The photo at the left shows the physical laboratory, which was actually located behind that wall in this building, in the original building of the institute. In this and other labs, students performed hands-on measurements on equipment replicated from high-impact publications of science and engineering. Two of these setups used to characterize the behavior of steam um, and their critical thermophysical parameters for steam power are shown uh, there as well. The list at the right is a list from the 1878 catalog on the courses, it says cor order of exercises, sorry, in experimental mechanics, the course on experimental mechanics. So these are the experiments that they did in that class, in that course. 
At Stevens today, the systems lab in mechanical and chemical engineering and in other majors, they follow a very similar approach, performing experiments relevant to real-world applications in industry. The founding faculty of Stevens were active in not only teaching and creating a new curriculum in the early days, but were actively published, publishing in scholarly journals. And there's just a little list there at the right that you see of a few of those publications. Um, but each of these have the, the energy theme, where you see um, discussion of hydrocarbon fuels, solar science, hydrogen chemistry, and of course, steam power. To briefly highlight two other contributions of um, early faculty in the energy area, um, Stevens were involved, faculty were involved in early innovation of coal-based fuels. In 1918, researchers here were the first to implement anthracite coal in steam engines. Uh, anthracite was the first, uh, was the most, uh, is the highest energy content form of coal and had just been discovered 20 years prior. Uh, a second area of um, involvement was by Professor Coleman Sellers, who you see in the back right hand of that photo as part of a prestigious international uh, commission to decide on the appropriate technology to be used at Niagara Falls. The, the um, chairman of that committee is the formidable Lord Kelvin seated in the center of the group there. And they, so they chose the energy technology, power generation technology, that finally came on stream in 1896. In, at Stevens today, once we fast forward to um, the current situation, the early innovation and commitment of the Stevens family and the Institute faculty have borne fruit as we consider just a partial list of accomplishments uh, of what you see there. And what is of particular note are the items that truly convey the societal impact that the founders sought. And I won't go through uh, the list, but what you can see is that the Institute is steadily supplying talented technology and technology innovators to society. And it is doing it cost effectively. Oops, sorry. So as a small school, we choose to focus uh, research efforts in just a few key thematic areas that we're going to go into as the next uh, part of this presentation. Uh, the, th the three thrusts you see labeled there are listed down at the bottom. I'm going to cover the first two just uh, in highlight, and then I'll turn over the presentation to Professor Fisher uh, to present nanotechnology and the multi-scale systems area. So the first uh, thrust is in the area of secure systems. Uh, which covers security in, maritime, in the maritime domain and in information and communications technology. Um, the port security theme is a natural topic of research given Stephen's legacy in maritime engineering and transportation. Uh, and the, na the National Center for Secure and Resilient Maritime Commerce, which is the focal point of the activity, is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. In systems engineering and, in and enterprise management, um, that uh, group here provides graduate education and conducts doctoral research to address the complex problems facing society through the holistic uh, process involved in the systems engineering approach. The Systems Engineering Research Center is one of only 14 university-affiliated research centers, or UARCs, that are sponsored by the Department of Defense. It was founded in 2007 as a collaboration of 20 universities with Stevens as the lead. Thank you, Ron. The third research thrust of Stevens that I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about today is nanotechnology and multi-scale systems. The vision of this theme, of this uh, research thrust, is to enable systems level integration and implementation over a broad spectrum of length scales, cutting across engineering sciences and life sciences disciplines with nanotechnology as, you, as a key driver. As you can see, there are over 33 affiliated faculty whose research wholly or in part is associated with this research thrust. And funding for these external projects comes from various sources, including the National Science Foundation, DARPA, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and NASA. 
Currently on campus, there are over 70 externally funded research projects in the nanotechnology and multi-scale system. If you had a chance to visit the research colloquium yesterday, you would have seen 30 plus undergraduate projects who are related with nanotechnology research. One of the key areas of interdisciplinary research in this thrust is nanomaterials and nano-enabled systems. And here I've highlighted just a few examples of the innovative work that Stevens faculty are doing in this area. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the work of Professor Chang Wan Choi in mechanical engineering, who is developing new techniques to be able to create nanopattern superhydrophobic surfaces. Surfaces that are superhydrophobic are surfaces that are resistant to rusting. And Professor Choi has received significant funding from the Office of Naval Research to investigate rust uh, corrosion resistant surfaces. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see um, the work of Professor Shuskavili in the Chemistry, Chemical, Biology, and Biomedical Engineering Department, whose international expertise is in self assembled polymers in solution and on surfaces. In the lower left hand corner, is the, is the group of Professors Meng, Crystallatus, and Corfiatis in the Center for Environmental Systems, who have developed and pioneered techniques to use nano-sized titanium dioxide to absorb uh, heavy metals and other impure, uh, impurities uh, from water. In the lower right-hand side, you'll see the hybrid extrusion electrospinning process developed in the lab of Professor Dohan Kalyan and the Highly Filled Materials Institute in Chemical Engineering. A second major re research theme in the nanotechnology and multi-scale systems is the nanobio interface. And I've listed just a few of the faculty from a wide variety of departments who are contributing their various expertise into the, in, in this research thrust. For example, one project that's been funded by the National Science Foundation is to develop differential or nanostructured surfaces which provide differential cell adhesion. These would be surfaces ideal for implant materials where healthy cells would be able to adhere to the surface while bacteria and other, um, and other cells uh, would not be able to stick to the surface so that you could get better implant performance. The third area that I'd like to talk about is research and distrust in energy. And here I've highlighted just a few examples. Uh, the first is in solar photovoltaics where a, the, an interdisciplinary group of faculty with Professor Okora, Professor Besser, myself, and Professor Shuskavili are looking to develop multifunctional nanocomposite films with both anti-reflective properties as well as the capability to enhance the quantum efficiency of these photovoltaic devices. The enhancement in quantum efficiency could be captured by using specialized nanoparticles which would be able to convert the energetic photons in UV and not near UV radiation or levels to energies which correspond to the maximum quantum efficiency of the solar device. The, approach, the approaches that we're investigating use layer-by-layer -layer technology and a layer-by-layer -layer approach, which we are interested in because it could be technology potentially environmentally friendly and potentially scalable, and we're pursuing these ideas with, uh, with industry sponsors and industry uh, collaborators. The second area is energy harvesting and energy scavenging. Here the idea is to convert ambient energy in, uh, in a given environment to create low levels of electrical energy, which could be useful for different applications. One potential application of this technology would be to locally power the individual nodes of a sensor network. This, sens this sensor network could be used in homeland security or in national infrastructure. For example, to monitor the structural health of uh, critical civil infrastructure such as bridges and roads. In this area, I've highlighted a couple of work, uh, a few work that's been done, that is being done in mechanical engineering. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see multifunctional nanowires and nanofibers. Uh, PZT is the uh, gold standard of piezoelectric materials, and Professor Yang Shi and his students have patented a way to make PZT nanofibers, which could have uh, very innovative applications in, uh, as nano and multi, uh, micro scale um, energy harvesting uh, uh, transduction mechanisms. In the lower left hand corner is work of myself with Professors Prasad and Capillary looking at developing new techniques for ambient vibration energy harvesting. And in addition, develop, we're pursuing techniques which can make an autonomous system where we would be able to automatically tune the resonance of our device to match the environmental source frequency. 
In the lower right-hand corner is an energy harvesting project uh, with a number of collaborators in mechanical engineering led by Professors Manichuri and Pojaraju looking at using energy harvesting from energetic materials. The third work of, uh, in the energy theme um, in the nano and multi-scale um, research for Lusset Stevens is graphene for energy applications. Okay. Graphene was, uh, uh, research in graphene led to the two, 2010 Nobel Prize. And there's a number of different faculty and different research projects who are doing very leading edge, very innovative work in this area. For example, on the lower left hand corner of the screen um, is from a recent paper from professors Yang in mechanical engineering, Professor Stefan Strauff and his students in physics investigating the uh, fundamental opto optoelectrical properties of graphene. In the upper right hand corner is work being done in Professor Yang's group in mechanical engineering pursuing novel ways to do nanomanufacturing to create 3D graphene carbon nanotube multi-stack architectures for portable power systems. Here the idea of using carbon nanotube spacers to separate the individual layers of graphene could prevent agglomeration of graphene sheets and lead to increased surface area, which could lead to enhanced supercapacitor performance. In the lower right-hand corner is the work from Professor Woolley's group in the chemical engineering and material, uh, um, material science departments, uh, where they were the first group to use uh, inkjet printing and thermal reduction of graphene uh, to create graphene oxide, okay, this technique as a patent pending. Okay. I did want to touch on some of the research that's being done outside of the nano and multi-scale system work, but that's still related to energy. And there are some great examples of that in the Davidson Laboratory. On the left is Seahorse Power LLC, which is a new Stevens uh, startup company, which is developing offshore energy technology, um, core technologies, to be able to harness energy uh, from the ocean. Their patented design is based on shoaling wave energy. This approach increases the amplitude of existing waves um, and increases the amplitude of the bobbing of the device and has led to a 400% increase in the energy production. On the right-hand side is perhaps one of the newest projects in the School of Engineering, uh, which is the offshore wind energy project funded by the Department of Energy. Here, Professor Tom Harrington and colleagues are looking at developing LIDAR techniques to be able to acquire 3D um, maps of offshore wind speeds, which would be useful for optimizing offshore wind uh, turbine performance. So in conclusion, the legacy of Stevens has been driving innovation. We have seen this in the founders, and we hope that we can continue this excellent tradition today. There are a number of uh, educational projects and educational initiatives which we are developing to try to increase and facilitate innovation, entrepreneurship within our undergraduate students. Some of these projects would include uh, an NSF GK12 funded project where we are working with PhD students who are working, uh, spending 10 hours a week working in local high schools to excite the student, those students about science and engineering while at the same time helping our PhD students become better communicators of their technical research. There is also a project sponsored by the National Science Foundation where Stevens and the Center for Innovation in Engineering and Science Education are training middle school teachers, over 400 middle school teachers in the next five years to be more competent and more tech, um, and, and have better fundamentals in, science, in, in the science courses so that they can transfer that, that knowledge to their students. So in the end, um, we see Stevens as a campus, as a test bed, as an incubator for innovation, uh, both in education and in energy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drs. Besser and Fisher. Um, we're going to actually step off stage for just a moment while we rearrange furniture, and then we will be right back for the roundtable discussion. So bear with us for two minutes. Is it now?
too long. Great, and now we're beginning our roundtable discussion. Um, thank you everyone for staying with us here. Um, and thank you again to these panelists who are here today. Um, the two professors, Dr. Besser and Fisher, have asked that, um, that they could ask some questions of, of Dr. Chu um, and Dr. Kim as well. So I would like to let you start off okay. with the question. Um, I have a question for Secretary Chu. Uh, your talk was very interesting. And um, the need for innovation in energy technology, you made that very clear. Um, and I wondered if you would be able to speak a bit about um, what needs to happen in nuclear energy or where you see us going there. And also, you mentioned, I think you used the word biofuels, but you didn't talk about them at length. I wonder if how you see those two elements in kind of going forward um, in the energy picture. All right, well, first let me say that I, I do think um, in this century, nuclear energy has a role. Um, uh, right now, though, we use about 0.7.8% of the energy worth uh, in the uranium uh, in generating electricity. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we can use 20 or 30% to generate the same amount of electricity? And so one wants to think of ways of doing that. That's a longer term. The shorter term, we know we can get to 2%. Um, we, uh, the safety is improving and uh, the next generation will be safer. There's also, um, we'd like to support the development of what are called small modular reactors because the financial model of the larger reactors, one to one and a half gigawatts, doesn't, they were trying to achieve an economy by making a single thing big. But in many instances, uh, it's too big. It, it, it doesn't have adequate cooling, it actually doesn't have any electrical infrastructure. And so there's another <clears throat> possibility of getting economy of scale in numbers, mass produced in a single factory you can ship around the world. And uh, these are the small modular reactors. And so we're trying to allow, we're trying to support a little program that allows uh, them to be developed and uh, licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Agency. Right now, um, there are some people in Congress who don't want us to start this until we can deal with the nuclear waste issue. Uh, the nuclear waste issue is, I think, a solvable problem both technically and politically, but you have to start again. Uh, uh, the experiences of Sweden and Finland are uh, you can engage the people and you can make it actually attractive. And in Sweden, they just went through this bidding process where the three entities who wanted the nuclear waste. Because <laughs> it was actually, a, they're, they're, uh, it brings a lot of income into the area. And you can convince people to do it safely. So this is a very different attitude and I think, and, and it's being done in Finland now. And so, so let's, so, so anyway, so it's both a sociological, political, and technical issues. Um, in terms of biofuels, again, some great promise. Uh, I'm talking about now the next generation of biofuels beyond corn ethanol. Uh, sugar ethanol in Brazil and other climates like that make a lot of sense, both environmentally and economically, and uh, in the carbon footprint is also very good. Uh, we'd like to do the same for biofuels based on agricultural residues, uh, wheat straw, corn cobs, corn stover, uh, lumber, things of that nature, crops that have much higher yield, less much energy input. Uh, but right now, the technologies we now have are not competitive. But again, this is a very rapidly changing area in, in science and technology. And although we, I can't say for certainty we, whether we're gonna be able to pilot something in one, two, five years that would actually be able to produce uh, next generation biofuels, whether it's ethanol or even drop in substitutes, uh, commercially viable without subsidy, which is our goal. If you use the gas, which is the stalks of um, sugar in Brazil, uh, there are companies using technology developed in the United States um, that think it's, they can make drop-in diesel replacement 
at $4 a gallon with profit. That means they can sell at $4 a gallon and they're going to make a profit. Um, but again, that's Brazil, that's not us. And so right now we see five or six, five or six dollars is a little bit too high. But, but we're optimistic, I, I can't guarantee. So, so this is coming along. The fact that the United States has great agricultural resources, even without even going to you know, uh, wilderness cropland, all those other things, you leave them alone, we have, we have the capacity to Ultimately, if it's economically viable, probably get on the order of a third of our transportation fuel from biofuels. And so that's the possibility, uh, but we are trying to work on the making it uh, economically viable without subsidy. Right, um, and what can Congress in Washington do to speed the development of next generation biofuels? Um, I think it's, first, uh, don't turn off the research and development tab. Uh, because right now there's uh, a debate in Washington, we can't afford uh, to even maintain research and development. We can't afford to maintain a lot of the things, um, and so we got to hunker down. Uh, this is why I gave this example in my talk about the Transcontinental Railroad. There were two other things that were done in the Civil War. Uh, one was the start of the land-grant university system, uh, which was designed to put a more scientific technological basis in U.S. agriculture and the mechanical arts. So Iowa State and Michigan State and, and uh, places like that started land-grant universities. In the Civil War, what is less known is that um, MIT and Cornell, University of California and Berkeley were land-grant schools. Even though we were in the Civil War, the, the, the federal government was willing to subsidize the creation of these schools. They also, uh, Lincoln said, you know what, it would be wonderful if uh, we got the best scientists in the country to give advice to the U.S. government. So he started the National Academy of Sciences as an advisory group. So we're in a different time now. Uh, we're, we're, I, don't th I don't think we're in a more disparate situation than we were in the Civil War. <laughs> and yet, we're not thinking this way. So, so number one, uh, even though that was a very desperate situation, they took a long view. And they took a long view during the coldest, darkest days of the Cold War, and um, I hope that the United States can return back to its roots. And that used to be the U.S. Uh, <laughs> is, is something, and, and we should be, still be taking that long view. If you just take that long view, we can, we, we can do this and we can, we can be ahead of uh, any other country in the world. But if you then say, well, if you just hunker down and say, nope, the motto is um, uh, less government is better government, um, then we'll have a different future. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and I do want to allow this to be a kind of natural, free-flowing free discussion, but first I, I wanted to ask, um, Dr. Fisher, do you have a question for, for Dr. Kim at all? Um, so yes, Dr. Kim, um, I very much enjoyed your talk, and especially the uh, suggestions and, and the characteristics that you noted for um, innovative people and, and innovative companies. Do you think there are things that, as a university uh, educator, um, as faculty, that we can do to facilitate the development of those um, attributes in our students? I think the uh, culture of innovation uh, requires a, uh, a mindset of taking risk is a natural thing. And the failure is a natural thing when it happens. And uh, a really teach them how to get up after failure and try you know, again. Because only through the failures you really learn uh, how to be spectacularly successful. And I think all your ex experiences in your career are better off you will be. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have challenges when you move into the company, because uh, the leadership in the company, in many of the big corporations are ones who have been successful um, by the systems that I deployed and that I you know, explained that the systems that we use are typically the you know, KPIs. Mm -hmm. So um, they really haven't experienced the failures um, because of our set law. And 
So this is still going to be challenges. But you know, it's a new generation of uh, uh, people coming from universities that will rise up to the top. And we need to overwhelm the culture um, that the risk taking is natural, failure is a natural thing to happen. And uh, that aspect of it, you know, I think a uh, university can instill in addition to you know, a formal education. Can, can I add a little sure. to that? Um, I was talking to John about this, and I, I learned how to fail very well when I was a graduate student. Um, <laughs> I had f four projects I worked on, and the first three I decided not to continue, and the fourth one I finally finished. Um, they were very different, you know, theoretical astrophysics problem, a beta decay problem, uh, something on an accelerator, and then I ended up with what I did end up with, which worked well enough that it, they made me assistant professor of physics at Berkeley. Um, and, and then when I, instead of starting my group then, I took a leave of absence, went to Bell Labs, spent nine years, where I again had a similar ratio. However, uh, what people don't know, and they say, everything you touch turned to gold, I said, no, I failed very quickly and then move on. Mm -hmm. Because I would be exploring very many things, and after two or three months, I said, this is not going to work. Go on to the next thing. I had a list of things I would work, try. And so, again, um, and so one out of four, I thought was pretty good. Uh, to the outside world, it looked like everything was working, but actually, you just want to fail, but you want to fail fast. And move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you think about it, you know, we have a, a leadership crisis in our country in the corporations. I mean, you know, I asked you, you know, how much heat are you taking from the, the failed investment in the, the solar cell company, and you said a lot. And uh, you know, a, so even though it seems to me, you know, that a, uh, it's a natural thing for the Department of Energy to do, uh, and failure is a natural outcome, there's a public, uh, you know, a fear. You know, the government is being irresponsible. How do you fight that? Um, it's very difficult. As some of you have probably noticed, there's been a lot of things coming out watching you about a failure of a particular loan of a solar company. Um, and and the, the remarkable thing about the whole loan program was designed by Congress to include what's called the loan reserve. That means you actually spend money to buy insurance that the loan may not uh, actually pay back. So the Department of Energy spent about six billion dollars in loan insurance. That means it's tagged as an actual expense, logged in. Uh, that money could have gone to do research, it could have gone to hire more high school teachers, it could have done many, many things. So, so six billion dollars. So we have a half a billion dollar loan failure and all sorts of people saying, when is the next shoe going to drop? This is terrible. What an outrage. They forgot they set aside all that money, and, and I actually think if we have only $1 billion worth of failures, which I, we may have, it's almost mathematically impossible, since we know what's happening, to get even $3 billion of failures. Um, we will fail. Why? Because if we have $1 billion of failures and we spent $6 billion, we wasted $5 million. Mm -hmm. But they forgot all of that, mm -hmm. because they want to embarrass the administration which is remarkable. So in their wisdom, when they set up this program, they said, you know what, some of these things will fail. And what it's done, more than anything else, is all the career people, all the good career people who, who do this, they just want to not do any more loans. Mm -hmm. They want to do anything risky. They don't want to do anything anymore. And that would be a terrible shame. And so, so again, it's, um, it's whether whether people in Congress can wake up and say, no, this is a good thing. We expected failure. In fact, if we don't have any failure, we would have not had enough risk. Yeah. Uh, because we were supposed to fund innovative things. Do you foresee the government's role in, in investing in um, innovation in the future is going to be changing related to this? Uh, I hope not. I think we should be going in quite the opposite direction. I think uh, uh, that. Uh, all the countries I see uh, around the world view energy as the next really big thing, as I tried to outline in my talk. Um, they view it as a critical industry, uh, China especially, but, that, but it's true of Korea, it's true of Japan, it's true of all the other countries. So, and they, they, they want to nurture 
indigenous creation of this innovation because they also see a worldwide mar market. And you know, I was talking with a bunch of energy ministers a couple weeks ago, and the one from Great Britain said, um, you know, China has this humongous loan program. All the other countries in Europe have these loan programs that will enable us to nurture these innovative technologies, and we decided we, we have to do this. I said, but how can you do this? Because there are hard financial times. You know, Great Britain is uh, as, as bad as we are. And I said, yeah, we understand that, and it's actually run by a conservative government. But that government doesn't even debate whether the climate's changed or whether it's caused by humans. Uh, and he said, but we have to do this. Uh, but we're, I'm embarrassed to say we've not it's a small program. I said, well, how small? Uh, three billion pounds. <laughs> About five billion US dollars, and um, which is much bigger than anyone is talking about in the United States, especially as you scale to the GDP. China had, just last year, three, four billion dollars. So, and the year before, 16. So, so other countries think that this, actually they borrowed from the US playbook. You know, that used to be us. <laughs> and, and, and we've forgotten. And, and so, uh, but if we, if we get afraid and hunker down, then, well, uh, we could be wrong and everybody else right, or we could be right and everybody else wrong. And, and if you do the risk benefit of who's right and who's wrong, I, I think you want to, you know, just the traditional game theory would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope it doesn't work out that way, but we'll see. I have a question about, um, since both of you were um, involved uh, at Bell Labs and currently involved, how do you see um, the corporate R&D picture shaping up? That's something when we think of Bell Labs, we think of the golden age of Bell Labs maybe 20 years ago, and then some changes and so on. Um, and, and then yet you see a, a company like Google and it's sort of fostering this creative environment again. And I, I'm just wondering, maybe the two of you could comment on where you see uh, you know, corporate R&D going and how does that fit into um, you know, making these things happen? How does that fit into innovation maybe in this energy area? Well, let me try to um, take a crack at it. Even though Google is highly successful, if you talk to some of the Google researchers today, they will acknowledge Bell Lab has more um, freedom in terms of how, they, how we can explore, even today. And many of the Google researchers were used to work at Bell Labs, so um, that's the feedback I get. Now, what makes Bell Labs successful? What's the global brain? When you take you know, the best and brightest from all over the world, it is always going to be better than taking the best and brightest from the local group. So in my view is that research has to be global, but development can be local, which promotes the a economic prosperity. You know, there's no way to hide behind any kind of a, 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 a physical boundary of intellectual property generated in terms of creation of new knowledge. You have to compete globally. You have to open yourself up. So I'm a big believer in open innovation and compete globally see if you are the best in the world. Only you publish it, to, what to see, people to comment on it, you will know whether you are best and brightest. Um, and there is a role for a industrial research. Um, if you look at the startup companies, although they can grow very fast, they are limited uh, in terms of uh, expertise they can really focus on. So maybe five, 10 real smart people that focus on each market. And you know, a company like Google is an exception because they were able to quickly grow and broaden. But in the lab, we have hundreds of researchers in different disciplines. And when you actually have that many number, the critical mass actually reached to a point where you can take on big projects. Like when you're taking on the energy-related issues. The Bell Lab says recently, about a year and a half ago, announced it, that we're gonna try to come up with architecture that will reduce that energy consumption Okay, of an entire network by a factor of 1,000. I'm not talking about 20% improvement year over year or whatever. Factor of 1,000 in five years, we're gonna to try to demonstrate the architecture with technology. No startup can possibly take on that. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, industrial research has a role in it. And again, as I said in my speech, the market interactions that is very rapid and have a quick feedback has a role. In academic research, just that simply doesn't exist. You know, of course, they talk with the market you know, in a way, but not in a sense that the industrial lab actually operates. There is a role in it. It's something that we had. Everybody's trying to copy it, but we are running away from it. You know, it's kind of sad. And Secretary Chu, if you have something to add, that would be wonderful. Um, I do want to allow us a little bit of time to take some audience questions. Okay. Um, but very, go ahead very first. quickly, you know, I think I think there industrial labs like Actel, and Bell Labs, uh, Microsoft, uh, Intel has very interesting research, but it has qualitatively changed from 20 years ago and the previous century. If you think of the great industrial labs, it didn't start with Bell. Bell Labs was certainly one of them, GE Labs, GM had a great laboratory, Xerox Park was a great laboratory, IBM. Uh, they're, they've shrunk, their scope has changed, their scope is more targeted. And so many of the, th and because um, uh, one doesn't, and then the startup companies don't have the resources for the far-reaching research. So things have changed considerably. In the energy sector, it's totally different because the people in those businesses um, where it started as utility companies, which you're a cost plus outfit, you're guaranteed a return on your investment, the incentive to innovate isn't in the culture. And so uh, it's a very different story. Uh, and I'll end on one story. Uh, I remember it was in the National Academy panel before he was Secretary of America's Energy Future. And I put myself in two sub-panels. One is alternative fuels and one is transmission distribution. We're going out finding out where the innovation will be, what's going to be the future of transmission uh, and distribution of electricity. And we were getting complaints from ABB and Siemens. They said, the American market's terrible. Uh, you go to, and they say, we had this transformer and it just blew up. It, um, can you build us another one? And I said, no, that transformer was built 50 years ago. We've gone much beyond that. We can sell you a better one for half the cost. No, I want the other one, but it'll cost you so much money because it'll have to be custom made. I want that one. It worked before, it'll work again. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, I think we might be out of time. Is, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I was just trying to read the signals, but. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, we don't have any time for audience questions, guys. You all have to get to lunch, I've been told. So, um, and that's just down the, the hallway. Um, our colloquium has concluded. I would really like to thank Dr. Spavardin, uh, Dr. Chu, Dr. Kim, Dr. Korfiadis, Dr. Besser, and Dr. Fisher for their participation in this event. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the inauguration ceremony this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.